Welcome back to Heroes Next Door. Today on Station Rigs, this one's very unique because it's something we've never done before. We are working with the Pennsylvania Wilderness Search Rescue Team and they have a bunch of trailers. All of them are set up very unique, so let's go take a look. So we are in Lancaster County today. This is Pennsylvania Dutch country. This is the Thousand Trails Camp Resort and we're gonna go talk to the chief and have him explain what we have here. Hey, Chief, how you doing today? Good, Mike, how are you? Not too bad, thanks for inviting us out. Thanks you got for a coming. bunch of stuff going on today. Yep. So why are we here? So uh, we're, it's a training weekend for us. Um, it's also a Heroes Weekend up here at the campground. So uh, they asked us to come out and display some of our equipment and some of our canines. So that's what we're doing here today. Okay. Now you have brought three different trailers with you. We did. We're standing in your command trailer. Yeah, this is uh, Lancaster County Special Unit uh, 962. It is a uh, 18 foot uh, trailer that we use for communications. That's his primary job. Okay. Now, what is this outfitted with? Can you talk me through everything that you have in here? Sure, love to. Uh, so this is basically set up. We're a, a Pennsylvania Search and Rescue Council approved team. We're a level one team. So the way that works is we cover seven counties uh, as our primary area. And we couldn't have the radios for every county. So it would just cost us a fortune. So what we do is we kind of bring our own uh, toys to the, to the game here. So uh, primarily uh, we use a uh, public service repeater. That's the unit there under the computer. Um, to back that up, we have a digital system that we've uh, started using recently and it's been working very well in the area. And then some of the other uh, products that are around that we have uh, uh, digital scanner to monitor the fire and the police and whatever's going on on a search. Uh, some of the teams that we work with use amateur radio, ham radio. Um, so we have one of those radios there as well to um, kind of back them up if they get busy. Uh, and then a couple just uh, the, the old analog system, VHF and UHF radios. Okay. Um, we'll monitor that as well. Okay. Now, do all your members have their own radios on them? Like, do they show up at one scene or do you use this command view just to ha hand out radios to people? How does that work? A little bit of both. Okay. Um, so some of the team members have the digital radios. Most of the team members have the analog radios, the older system. But we do have some spares. You know, if they come in, the battery's dead or, you know, they've been out all day long and their battery goes bad, we can back them up with some more. Okay. Okay. Now I noticed you got a lot of plugs and stuff like that. How is this run? So um, there's a uh, uh, 3000 watt uh, inverter generator on board that uh, can power this unit. We can be totally self-sufficient. Uh, there's a uh, internet uh, through a cradle point and that allows uh, not only the primary area to have internet, but as well as uh, secondary. Sometimes we'll have, you know, police or fire in here as well to do, uh, you know, command with, so everyone's talking to each other. Right. Um, so we, they can hook in to their computer and all that and have internet and we can all be on the same page and that'll go into, we have access to a, a digital printer then. Okay, and this trailer is towed by what? Is it a special vehicle or? Just my personal truck. Your personal yep. truck tows it? Yep. Okay, and do you hold this at your house? Is there a central I do. location? Or? No, we, so we don't have a, sta a hard station. Um, okay. It's just the, the money for search and rescue in Pennsylvania just isn't there to support right. uh, a huge station. So all, we all run out of our house. Um, so mine's parked at my place. And uh, when we get called, I load it up, hook it up, and now I go. Okay, okay. There's two other trailers that we're gonna take a look at in a little bit. How heavy is this trailer? How big is it? You said it was 18 foot. Yeah, the way it sits here, it's about 5,000 pounds. Okay, so it's not so. too bad to haul around. Yeah, no, it works up. There's, you know, different equipment on board. Uh, you know, if we're working out of the trailer here, um, this is set up to do that very quickly. Uh, a lot of times we'll uh, operate out of a fire company or a church or something like that. Okay. So we have additional uh, radios. Everything in here almost is duplicated. So we can take that inside. There's portable masts, uh, that sort of thing, portable antennas okay. that we can set up and operate there without having to tear everything out here. Okay. Now, how do you guys operate? Are you volunteer? Are you paid? 100% um, volunteer. Okay. And most of our resources and assets come out of the pockets of our members. Okay, okay. Do you do any kind of fundraising or anything like that? We do, we do uh, meet and greets like we're doing here today. You know, we'll visit some of the uh, Walmarts and that sort of thing back before COVID. It was, uh, and you know, and people just love coming up, greeting the dogs and you know, they'll throw a dollar or two right, in the Right, right. So pot, it's kind so. of like the old boot drives. That we Absolutely, do. yep, yep. So uh, do they have a place that if the viewers are out there, cause we're showing this, you know, locally, we're showing it nationally and internationally. Okay. What if they wanted to donate to you guys? Is there a website they can go there to? There is. Our, the team's website is uh, www.pulsar.org, okay. PA Wilderness Search and Rescue. 
Uh, there's a link on there that through PayPal they can do a donation. That would be very much appreciated. Okay. What if somebody has, you know, an interest in this? Is that the same place they would go? Same. Yep. Website. Um, you can get involved. Um, send us an email. Uh, we have a, a, a perspective uh, member packet that we can forward to you. You can look at it, see if it's for you. Okay. Tell me a little, as we kind of walk around, I want you to tell me a little bit more about what Wilderness Search and Rescue is about. What, what, is, what do you get called for? Why is it a necessity? So um, with the changes, uh, the healthcare system, more and more um, folks that are suffering from dementia, Alzheimer's, are being uh, cared for at home. And a lot of times that they'll uh, leave you know, middle of the night or middle of the day, whatever. And, you know, we're available through law enforcement requests or fire department requests to come out. We're a resource, you know, to assist the fire department, police department to come out and we can put, you know, boots on the ground where they're not paying folks overtime to do it. Right. We can come out, you know, call us early. We'd much rather, you know, hey, we found them, turn around, go home. Uh, a lot of times, some of the battles that we have is they wait 10, 12 hours before they call us. Right, yeah. And a that's kind of wait until they're trying to do it themselves. So yeah. The police department will go out and search. Now, you guys bring a, a very unique aspect. When we go out with a firehouse, we just walk the woods. Right. Or, you know, we have a police officer and we got spotlights, maybe thermal imaging cameras. Which is but that's, but that's pretty much about it. Right. You guys bring certain animals to yes. help you with this. Uh, so we have uh, several uh, canines um, that do sense specific trailing. Um, air scent, which is they'll see if there's a human in a certain area. Um, and also, you know, it, there's a fact of life. Some folks go out in the uh, woods, do themselves harm. We have dogs that can uh, find the uh, human remains right. and get them back home to the family. Okay. It's kind of not a, a good part of the whole it's thing. It's not, but it's a part that, you know, us as EMS providers and, and professionals that do this, it's unfortunate we can't, got to come across that, Absolutely. but that's a service that is out there. We don't want to leave somebody out in the woods. Absolutely. Uh, in in that kind of emergency. Absolutely. All right. So this is your command trailer. Yeah. Uh, is there a designation for this trailer at all? Like this a is, certain number? Yeah, especially in 96.2. Okay. And if I need you, I just call 911 and tell them I need you? Correct. You just go through Lancaster County Wide Communications and request our services and they'll, get, they'll dispatch us. All right. We have two more trailers to take a look at and a couple other unique tools. So let's go take a look at those. Absolutely. So they have two more trailers we want to take a look at. This next one is actually a team trailer. Uh, the one we just came from was actually owned by Dave, so he, you know, donates a lot of his money uh, for this kind of effort. We're going to run into Pat. He is the deputy chief of the department, right? That's true. That's so right. this is uh, the team trailer, and it's got a whole lot of stuff in it. Can you kind of talk us through and, and tell our viewers what you have in here? Yeah, sure. So I, I think the easiest way to start is what this trailer is really for. So, you know, we run a lot of communications and operations out of Dave's big trailer over there. This is a smaller trailer, but it has a lot of capabilities. And so being a wilderness team, sometimes we need to get into places that aren't easy to access. So this is a smaller trailer than uh, our big communications trailer, um, but it still maintains the capability to communicate, to run operations if we need to. But really the focus of this trailer is the actual rescue equipment that's in here, the wilderness rescue, wilderness medicine equipment. And so we'll take a look at that. Okay, yeah, we'll step on side. So what we have here, we have, um, sometimes we set up uh, in buildings, we set up uh, outside the trailer. Um, so we have, you know, an easel. We have uh, signs to uh, show people, you know, where check-in is and uh, where the sign, you know, the sign-in stuff and training event signs, that sort of thing. Okay. So we keep those on the outside here. So check-in is like accountability. It's your yeah, absolutely. So anybody that yep. shows up and wants to help out, you you're gonna track them because you don't absolutely. want them getting lost. Absolutely. And you know, when we're working with search and rescue teams. Uh, some teams use their ID cards, but a lot of times we end up working with uh, fire departments or other local volunteer agencies where they might not have like an ID card that they use for accountability. Um, so we do have a sign-in process using like index cards, um, and then we can account for everybody that's you know on a task, you know where where they go throughout the uh, uh, the search, whether they're going to something like uh, you know they're going to the staging area, or we're signing them out to a field task, or okay. you know maybe a lot of times we use some of those volunteers to help with the actual sign process for some of the overhead operations so okay yep okay. so we're a Pennsylvania search and rescue council team okay and what that means is that the Pennsylvania search and rescue council is a voluntary organization search teams who want to belong to it have to meet a certain set of standards okay and those standards include not only the training of the, the personnel but also the equipment we need to carry okay so a lot of our you know what we would consider our certification equipment for the team 
is on this trailer. So that way, when we have to do our inspection, gotcha. those trailers are sort of ancillary. This trailer is really what would be inspected. Okay, so just like an, an ambulance, you know, I have to Absolutely. have a certain amount of minimal cost. Absolutely. You know, I have to have so many Band-Aids, so many this, yep. and so many that. This is the trailer that has all that stuff to Absolutely. meet those Absolutely, yeah, and you know, some things, like just like an uh, ambulance, you have different levels you have. You might have a QRS, uh, which I know it's a Pennsylvania term, but quick response service, first responder. Right. So you have QRS, you have, you know, BLS, you know, your, your EMT level ambulance, you have an ALS unit. Peace Arc has the same thing. We have level four teams, level three teams, level two teams, level one team, level one being the highest, and we're a Peace Arc level one team. Okay. And a lot of that, again, relates to the equipment that we have at our disposal. Right. Um, yeah. Some of the key pieces of equipment that a level one one team has that you know maybe another team doesn't we actually have a, a repeater system okay so you saw that we have we actually have a repeater system in that trailer as well right um, you know this is something that we're, we're lucky enough to have two repeater systems and that helps you with distance of communications absolutely yeah so if you think of using your portable radio you might be transmitting at five watts okay this will take that and repeat it back out at 25 watts. So okay. for our you know, folks operating in the field, this serves as a, a booster sort of to get further out, to get to you know, maybe our, our main command post. Okay. We obviously have to take care of our, our team. So we have self-aid, you know, so searchers, they get headaches, they get sure. stomach aches. So, you know, we have a self-aid box. So for our folks in the field, they can come in here and they can get some uh, like over-the-counter medications, band-aids, take care of themselves. Right, right. Um, searches sometimes go on for days or, Maybe or some weeks. cream for some poison yep, ivy exactly. through the woods. <laughs> exactly. So that's one of the things that we have up there. You know, we have things like, you know, we have a generator over here with gasoline. So we want to make sure we don't harm the environment. If there's a spill, we have materials in here to clean those up. Okay. Over here is uh, extra radios and a, a GPS. So, you know, each bag is you know, everything that you need to operate, whatever that unit is. So, you know, this would be uh, one of the team GPSs, a uh, little bit higher sensitivity uh, GPS unit than, um, you know, your average, you know, iPhone might have. So okay. a little bit more sensitive position locating, and we can also connect this to the computer and download tracks. So uh, explain to me why you would need a GPS, because I'm searching for somebody. I don't sure. know their GPS coordinates. What is GPS then used for? So if we were to take a GPS and give it to every single person out on the field or every single team out in the field and we download the, those tracks, we can put them on the map and we can look at all the areas that we've covered and all the areas that we haven't. What areas are high probability that we haven't covered enough? You know, have we saturated this area with, you know, sometimes we'll use, um, you know, and my rule generally is three dogs to a problem. So if I put a dog out there and the dog doesn't come back with anything, that in and of itself doesn't mean anything you know, we're gonna put another dog in the same area and maybe a third dog. And after that, we might feel that we've saturated that area well enough okay. that the probability that they're in that area is pretty low. Okay. And the GPS tracks help confirm that too. When we look at where the dogs went, even within an area, there might be a, an area that the dogs maybe didn't hit as hard, and we might want to send a second little task out to that same area. So, right. Right. you know, the GPS tracks are really important. Here we actually have just, this is just extra medical supplies. So there's, you know, when we use stuff that's in our bag, if we want to re restock stuff, so the common stuff that we have, you know, ACE bandages or SAM splints, that kind of stuff we have restock of here. Okay. This is actually, this is a, a de-skunking kit. So if one of our dogs is on a search and happens across a skunk, there's uh, some dish detergent, some uh, baking soda, and some peroxide that we use to uh, de-skunk yeah, them before they get back in the about. car. Yeah. yeah, so things that, you know, maybe your average ambulance or fire truck <laughs> might not have. Um, in this bag, it's all our uh, cables for the antennas and everything. Okay. Uh, the actual antenna is uh, mounted over here in a plastic tube, and then when we need that, that protects that. Um, you know, antennas are tuned and they're sensitive, so if you don't protect them, um, you know, they, they won't work when you need them to, so make sure that stuff's protected. This is one of the bins that contains some of our certification stuff. So one of the prerequisites for being a, a certified Peace Arc team is uh, things like you have to have a certain number of orange vests and okay. it has to be orange. Now you see we have yellow in here as well, right? but we have to have a certain number of orange vests. Okay. We're, we're sometimes searching on DCNR land where there's hunters. Orange is the color that you need. Okay. Um, okay. So we have that in here. We also have to have a certain number of rolls of flagging tape. Okay. Uh, I, I believe it's, uh, it's, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's like 30, <laughs> it's like 30, 35 rolls of right. flagging tape. And right. you know, it's different colors for different, 
you know, different environments. So we need something that stands out. Sometimes we need to lay what we call flagging lines to differentiate a boundary for a search segment, okay. a search area. Yep. So yep. we also have man trackers on our team that can locate human footprints and actually track the footprints themselves. Okay. Um, things like chalk that you would use for a chalk line, yep. we use to mark them in a non-destructive manner. Okay. That way that you know, if there's any forensic investigation that needs to be done related to the footprints, we can mark them without altering them. Okay. We also have flagging markers. This can also be used to determine wind direction for our dogs. Right. This is actually just uh, like MREs, chips, um, a yeah. lot, you know, you see coffee makers in a lot of these right. rigs. I actually went a different route and we just got a, an electric water kettle. Okay. Because you can make coffee, you can make tea, you can- Hot chocolate. You, you can make hot chocolate. <laughs> you, you can make uh, mac and cheese, you know, it, it's uh, right. It's a little bit more useful to us, but especially- But you guys could be out on a job that's, you know, lasting hours, if not days. Yeah, depending on absolutely. I mean, we've been on searches that are several days in a row. Sometimes there are volunteer agencies that will come out and actually provide food for us. Other times there's not. So, you know, we still have to be able to maintain, um, you, you know, just the essentials of, of daily life ourselves. Right. We need to be able to support ourselves with food and hydration. We have a canine medical bag. So there are a couple of canine specific things in here. Okay. Um, things like, you know, peroxide, if a dog ever has an ingestion of a, uh, of a poison, you know, peroxide is one of the things that we would use to induce vomiting for the dogs. Um, and there's also a few other canine specific uh, pieces of equipment in there. We have our, uh, our laser printer down there. We have our toolbox, it's just standard hand tools. Uh, a ropes bag. Um, now we don't do high angle rescue, but we may do a low angle evolution okay. so yeah but if you got a steep incline that might yeah. be muddy yeah. or something like that yeah. you want to be safe where you guys because you don't want to get hurt absolutely you're going to hook up your z rig and, and work yep. your way down so what's this little thing over here this oh yeah this is this is great so stokes basket uh evolutions are incredibly difficult especially if you are just doing it by hand okay um you know our our rule of thumb is sort of uh you know you need six people to carry the litter but you need three times that to actually do the stokes evolution because you have six people on the litter the six people who are next up and then the, the six people that came off the litter that are arrested right so you know if you're looking at a minimum uh you know of of 18 people to do a stokes basket evolution this is actually a manpower extender because this is a litter wheel it, it's actually designed for military litters the i, I believe the raven okay, yeah, litter yeah, that the they utilize ones yep. that stretch out yep with a few simple modifications we were able to use it with our stokes basket okay so, so using uh tubular webbing with some ratchets and some hooks we're able to securely fasten our litter to this the advantage of this is it's got two wheels so if you saw our other litter wheel it's a single wheel it's still fairly stable but you, you need a couple more people because it's a, a very wide single wheel right this is two wheels, plus it has two kickstands on the end that we can flip up. So we can actually stop, flip up the kickstands, the litter stands on its own, and then we can do whatever we need to with the patient. Okay. So that's why this is this is really our primary litter wheel. The other one is sort of secondary. If I had the capability to deploy this, I would. Because okay. two people can utilize this to do a Stokes basket, okay. basket evolution. For those that you know are watching right now that don't know what a Stokes basket is, it's yep. basically a hard backboard with it's, a yeah, rack around it, right? Yeah, so we have one right here. It's against the wall. So this is a, a Stokes basket or basket litter. Yeah, so it's designed to put a person in there and or even carry gear out for a long ways, correct? Yeah, absolutely. They can actually be used for mountain rescue, urban rescue, confined spaces, anything where you need to do uh, an evacuation of a patient that maybe requires a little bit more um, Right. Technical. I, I like uh, the fact that you don't have the wire mesh one anymore. You went to a plastic bottom. We did. You can slide that across the ground without having to worry about well, picking so, up debris. If you so need to. this one, this one actually has bars under it, so it doesn't slide particularly well. Okay. Our, our other one slides a little bit better. And then the one thing that that isn't in here today, we have a, a sked litter. Okay. So we're we're one of the few teams I think that um, that has access to snowshoes and snow travel equipment, has trained with them. And uh, if we were to do some sort of a winter evacuation, we would use the the sked litter because it's really it's it's really a toboggan for, you know, for all intent and purposes. Right, so right. it's a great device. But that one doesn't slide quite as well. But the reason I like the hard bottom is, uh, you know, when you're in the woods, if you have to lower a patient down, you don't have to worry as much about a stick or a piece of rebar or or something sticking up and and, and you know and jabbing the patient. So okay. one of the things that we have. So this is a, a pre-rigged search pack. 
Okay. You know, if one of our team members is coming from their job or coming from home, didn't have time to go back and grab all their stuff, you know, and, and most of us do carry our stuff in our car, but you know, sometimes if I have to, you know, the back of my truck is a box with all my stuff, but if I just got finished hauling a, a load of mulch or something home, it might not be in there. And sure. if I have to respond to a search and respond quickly, knowing that there's already bags that are ready to go on the trailer, you know, it's an important asset. So um, we do have two bags on this trailer and one on the other trailer that are um, okay. that are set up for searchers. So the other thing, having spare bags, even knowing from the EMS side of it, they're pretty expensive to set up a bag, set yep. up a you know a e e EMS bag or something like that. Yeah. And you guys are getting this all by yourself. You yeah. guys are donating your own money yep. to, to to finance this. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, you know, I want to say thank you for doing that first of all. But uh, you know, hopefully, if there's anybody out there watching and they know how to write grants or want to help out you know get a hold of these guys they definitely can use your help so you got a, a whole bunch more stuff in here let's try to cover this real quickly yeah so over here we have um this is our rescue cart and if you think of the fire department and having a writ team yep. you know one of the things they do when they when they go to a structure fire they set up their writ team those guys go out they put their tarp out all their equipment this is kind of like the wilderness uh right. rescue equipment uh equivalent of that right okay, yeah so um on here, this goes with our Stokes basket. So one of the first guys uh, out when we when we get on scene, one of the first tasks we're gonna assign is someone to be in charge of our rescue operation. So that person is gonna take this cart out, wheel it outside. If it's raining, they can set up the, the easy up. Um, they're gonna get the Stokes basket out and they're gonna attach it to the litter wheel so it's ready to go because you always wanna be ready for the transition from search to rescue, okay. right? Because yeah. we're, we're search and rescue, we have to do both, but they're two different things, right. right? On this bag, we have an immobilization bag. So if we're gonna do C-spine immobilization, that's what this bag is. This is our field medical bag. So it's a lot smaller version of our medical bag. Down here, this big yellow bag, patient packaging bag. So, you know, it's a couple of different weights of sleeping bags. So summer weight, winter weight, sleeping bag. We have tarps as a vapor barrier. So hypothermic subjects, you wanna keep the wind, the rain, all that stuff off from them. Duct tape, duct tape is your friend, right? So we have lots of duct tape in there. Uh, blankets and padding, because one of the things that you don't typically think of when you're um, you know, moving a patient, at least in the EMS environment for that short period of time, pressure ulcers, right? right? So I'm also a critical care nurse and I would I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least make some sort of provisions for, for padding in our uh, patient packaging bag to prevent pressure ulcers, right? right? right. There's adult diapers in there. We don't want our patient to be, uh, you know, soaking wet, you know, urine, whatever. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that that patient is, um, you know, uh, you know, they're taken care of. One thing that might seem sort of strange is we have multiple stethoscopes in there. So if we're going to evacuate someone and we're going to package them up because they're hypothermic, we don't want to be opening that time and time again, right? right? Every time you do that, you let out any of the heat, you let in the cold. So if we're going to package up someone for a long transport, we're going to take a stethoscope, duct tape it to this side of the chest, this side of the chest, duct tape one over here, put the blood pressure cuff on, and then they're all gonna come out the top of the sleeping bag. So I can check lung sounds, okay. heart sounds, blood pressure, all without having to open everything back so up. Those are the kind of things that are trained. You just yep. don't naturally instinct say, oh, this is what we're gonna yep. do. This exactly. is something that you guys have done time and time again. Yep. We've learned it from the people who came before us, right? And yeah. we pass that along. Yeah. Yep. Very cool to have. Yeah, and uh, this is something we're, we're lucky enough to have a, a vacuum mattress. Okay. So there's a lot of little foam beads in there. Another way to prevent pressure ulcers and other sort of injuries. It also can be used as spinal immobilization if you need to, right. especially for people who anatomically don't fit a backboard very well. So you put this on the Stokes basket. Once the person is in there secured, suck all the air out, takes those foam beads, makes them nice and hard and kind of form fits to the patient. Uh, the one thing I mentioned as we're stepping out to go to the next one, yep. you're a nurse, right? Or I, I'm a, a nurse and a paramedic. A nurse yep. and a paramedic. So you, what kind of personnel do you have on this? You, you have nurse paramedics, you, do you have doctors? Yeah, so we, we, have, uh, we have two physicians on our team currently. Um, we have, uh, I think three of us are nurses. Uh, three of us are also paramedics. Uh, several EMTs and uh, some wilderness first responders. So that's awesome. we're actually a pretty medically heavy team. Yeah, so, that's yeah. awesome. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. I think we're going to step out and go see Keith. He's got the other one. Yep. He's got a lot of the water rescue stuff. Yes, absolutely. So, Pat, right. we appreciate it, brother. Yeah, no problem. So thank you very All much. Right. Take care. So making our way over to the third trailer, we're going to run into another gentleman here. This is Keith. He is the assistant K-9 lieutenant, right? Yep. So thank you for inviting us out. Thank you. You have a, a another trailer that carries a whole lot of different stuff. Yep. So what do you have in this trailer? So this trailer that I carry is primarily for this boat. 
The boat is to support our search and rest or our water detection dogs. Okay. So basically, we have dogs that are uh, trained and certified to detect human remains underneath water. So drowning victims, um, swimming accidents, things like that. Wow, I wouldn't think that you know being under the water, a dog can smell that kind of thing. Yep, it's the same as. Um, as regular if a cadaver was on land the body will still decompose and release the gases and float to the surface okay and what kind of boat is this uh this is just a 12 foot john boat this is primarily for smooth water ponds small lakes uh, we work a electric trailing motor on it that allows no noise or odor contamination for when the dogs are working okay and you got all your safety equipment so your vest and stuff like that do you then dive off of this boat too um, or we don't dive the majority of the searches we're on we'll work off of fire department boats this is for we can't get anything in or we need to get into small areas okay um, or before the fire department comes out with their dive team um, we can handle sure what's the little buoy thing behind you uh, so this is an underwater drone we will typically use this if we get an indication from the dog that they're in human uh, detecting human remains that will bring out the drone and see if we can visually see anything under the water. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to put someone in the water right away. You can put the drone down there, take a look, make sure things are safe enough, and then get the fire department out to, to do yep. the dive. Yeah, and when, before the dive team goes in, that's the dogs are a great first tool because you don't want to put somebody in the water if you don't have to. Uh, the dogs are very fairly accurate. They will narrow down a certain area. Um, this might be able to narrow it down further, and then you can safely uh, put a diver in. The water. Okay. Now, you are the assistant canine uh, lieutenant, so you know more about these dogs. We've seen the other two trailers. We got the command, we got a lot of the rescue, land rescue search stuff with the GPSs and that kind of stuff. Tell us a little bit about the canine aspect. So, we have three different types of canines there's uh, scent specific trailing, there's uh, human remains detection, and there's air scent dogs. Um, all of them have different certifications and for different search, for search areas. Okay, do you use all those dogs all at once or do you do one at a time? How do you do it that? It depends on the search and the scenario, um, how old the, or how long the person's been missing, what kind of terrain, if it's urban or wilderness. Each dog kind of has a little specialty with different terrain areas. So how many dogs do you have on the team? We currently have 11 dogs on the team. Uh, some are in training, uh, most of them are certified. Okay, and these are all personal dogs. You Correct. don't, you know, the team supports them, but you own your own dog. Right? Yep. There are personal dogs. We do all the training. We're responsible for all their medical uh, vet bills and um, all their training. Right. And once again, you know, we talked about the command trailer. We talked about the rescue trailer. This is all a pretty big financial burden for people to do this. You know, a dog's not cheap, you know, whether it's just, just to buy the dog or to train the dog. So, you know, again, those people that are out there watching this, whether you're national, local, or international, if you want to help out and uh, really help a good team like this out, please give them a call, uh, hit them up on their website and, and uh, figure out how you can help them. So we appreciate it. Thank you. I got one last thing before we close this video out. Can we see some of these dogs yep. and say hi? Let's go get them. All right. So this is one of your boat or water rescue dogs, right? So tell me how this operates. Okay, so this is K9 Nakoma. He's six years old. <laughs> and uh, he's certified for water detection. Uh, basically, he works off the boat uh, in the front like he is now um, and is just searching for the, the X gases from the, the surface of the water. Okay. Uh, his train final response is uh, down. So he'll, he'll lay down on the boat and that would be his indication that he's in odor. Okay. And you've been working with him since he was a pup? Did yep. you get him as an older dog? How did that work? I got him as a pup and we started training pretty much right away. Okay. So, um, training typically takes about two years um, before they're up and ready to certify. Uh, he's certified as a trailing dog first, uh, so he's also a scent specific trailing. Okay. Um, and then once uh, he's certified in that, then we move on to a separate second. Now, this he's a unique looking dog. Is he a mix? What kind of dog is it? I've he never is seen. actually an American Indian dog. An American uh, Indian dog. Yep, and the bloodline traced back to the original dogs and Native Americans bred, and okay. they continue the same breeding practice. Does so. it get any bigger than this? Nope, this? he's full grown. He's six years old. Uh, he's about forty pounds. Um, so a nice, medium, athletic, athletic build. So. Right, right. So we got a couple more dogs here. We're gonna walk over and take a look at those. Keith, I appreciate it. Great, thank so, you. Thanks for showing us. Now we're gonna walk over and talk to Marnie. She's the lieutenant for the K9 area, so thank you for inviting us out. Oh, thank you. you. Have, thank you for having us. Yeah, you have two different dogs here. I do. And what are these ones used for? Uh, so Dakota is the Black Lab. She's a seven and a half year old dog, and um, I've been working with her since she was about a year and a half. She does scent specific trailing, 
Uh, she does land uh, cadaver and she does water work. Wow, so she's got a whole she works toolbox hard. to use. Yes, her. she does. <laughs> she does. So, and the one next to it? And this is Gaia. She's a two year old German Shepherd. She is trained exclusively in. Uh, cadaver uh, human remains wow wow at two years old you start training the dog uh no she actually i've had her since she was a puppy okay um and it just depends on the handler and the dog on how fast it takes to fully train a dog to certification okay i had her since she was a puppy she got she just got certified a couple months ago okay um so i had to get her through maturing growing up and learning how dogs do i always joke you don't want a kinder kindergartner to go to college, right. so you don't want a puppy to have a lot of work on them. Okay. Dakota I got when she was a little bit older, so I was able to get her certified in trailing in about six months. Okay. Now, you're talking about certifications. Who mm -hmm. does those certifications for you? Uh, we go through a law enforcement agency called uh, International Police Work Dog Association. Uh, that is our exclusive certification agency. Okay. We think it's really important for an outside agency to be able to look at our dogs and say, yes, these dogs are qualified to be able to go out there and find people. Okay. How long have you been doing this? 20 years. Wow. <laughs> hey, have you had a dog the whole time or did you kind of work your way up to dogs? I've had a dog the whole time. Yes. Uh, I started out with a pet dog that did not work out for me and I realized that this was something that I wanted to do with my life. So I got another dog immediately and I've been, this is, I think I is my seventh dog that I've worked in, in search and rescue. Well, we thank you for your service. Thank so you. appreciate you having us out. Thank you so much. Yep. So the final two dogs that we're going to take a look are belong to Cheryl. She's the training captain for the team. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting us in. You have two German Shepherds, it looks like. I do. Yes, I have um, Chase is actually my husband's dog. Chase is a two year old um, red and black German Shepherd certified as an air scent dog. And my dog, Hooli, is three. He'll be four in September. He is certified as a live find scent specific trailing dog. And he is dual certified as a land cadaver or human remains detection dog. Wow, that's a lot of work to do for, for dogs and for you. It is, but it's very rewarding. Okay. It's very rewarding. The one thing that we haven't touched on yet is, you know, I notice all the different breeds of dogs. Is there a certain breed that is good for doing this or does it really matter? Well, the, the mid to larger size, but not the giant dogs. Giant, giant breeds have a tendency to have a shorter lifespan. So, you know, when you're talking like Great Danes and, and the giant schnauzers and stuff, though they can do the work, they don't live as long. The smaller dogs are, are you know, they don't have the same scent capacity um, or the working drive. These are out of a breeder that breeds working German Shepherds. Okay. I just happen to like pointy-eared dogs. Really? Um, some people, the labs are great. We have bloodhounds. We've had bloodhounds on the team. Um, any dog that shows the drive, that is the one thing we do look for. I've had them both since they were eight weeks old. Um, when I was evaluating the puppies, I'm looking for the dog that, you know, I bring a toy to the two. I, I, I started evaluating his litter at four weeks and I take a toy. I look at the dog that, that shows the most interest in the toy, the one that's like most interested in getting to that food bowl that's maybe a little bit pushy around, right. around the other So there's puppies. a lot of psychology that goes into picking the right picking dog. Picking the right make, dog, yeah. Making sure for the right yeah. work, so. Yep. Yeah, it's no different than picking the right person to do search and rescue <laughs> or <laughs> something like that. It <laughs> well, takes a certain should. breed of us to do this too. Yeah. Once again, I just want to turn to the audience say here, you know, this is the Pennsylvania Wilderness Search and Rescue Team. Uh, they do a fantastic job. They have. A, array of tools including animals to help them do their job then once again this is heroes next door this is a special episode of station rigs thank you all for watching do us a favor hit that subscribe hit that notification because we're trying to hit that 50,000 mark in just a couple months